Okay, this video is called Caffeine Causes Brain Damage. It Activates Microglia. The first guy I show you here, his name is Matthew Shepard. He's sort of a world famous expert on sleep. He goes around the circuit of getting interviewed on all the bro science type uh, video channels. And I can tell you there's a lot of other famous uh, health experts, nutrition experts, doctors, etc. that go around telling you how great coffee and tea and caffeine are. And I'm going to tell you that I think they're wrong. And I'll tell you why. Um, if you look at the basic properties of caffeine, it mimics that of psychological stress. It increases cortisol and it increases catecholamines. Well, everybody knows stress is bad for you. Well, why wouldn't caffeine be bad for you if it does the same thing? Okay, so let's take a look at some more of the things that caffeine does and we'll see what you think. Okay, caffeine has a structure chemical structure very similar to adenosine okay this is called a purine ring these two rings together they're heterocyclic different types of cyclic rings each one has two nitrogens on it it's called a purine okay and you know if you want to be precise one's an imidazole the other's a pyrimidine you don't need to know that at all but what you do need to know is that it binds to the adenosine receptor and it will inhibit it okay and that's what causes the insomnia the inability to sleep the increased alertness and wakefulness okay so now, let's talk about some other things that caffeine does. Like the acute psychological stress response is to get you to survive being chased by a, di a tiger for the next, you know, 15, 30 minutes. So you don't need a lot of blood flow to your frontal lobes for thinking. You need more of your mammal brain. Remember the three-part vertical brain component theory um, of McLean. Basically, your brain stem is the primitive reptile brain. In the middle of your brain is the mammal brain, so to speak. And in the top of the brain is the cerebral cortex, the human thoughtful brain. Well, the point of the matter is caffeine reduces cerebral blood flow by an average of 27%. That's not a misprint. Caffeine reduces cerebral blood flow by an average of 20%. It decreases the blood supply to your frontal lobes, okay, to your brain. Now, you don't want that, okay? Here's another line. A 250 milligram dose of caffeine has been shown to reduce cerebral blood flow between 22% and 30%, okay? And these are normal dietary uh, concentrations. People will eat that much. That's not uncommon. Okay, drink that much. So it decreases cerebral blood flow. Remember, all of this stuff, the Jack Delatory theory about cerebral hypoperfusion, lack of blood flow to the brain causing dementia, why would you want to add to that with caffeine every day? Stupid, okay? And we're, we're just getting warmed up here. Wait till you see all this stuff. Now, I previously did a book review on this. You can watch that as a separate video called Caffeine Blues, Waking Up to the Dangers of America's Number One Drug. Okay, so it's a good book. It was written a while ago. I forget the exact year. Let's say around 20 years ago or something like that. Okay, and that's going to have a whole host of studies about the problems with caffeine. Well, anything that increases cortisol is going to increase the release of glutamate, the excitatory neurotransmitter, at your brain synapses. And it's known to do this in important brain areas. But one of the things people don't know is caffeine also increases cytoplasm, calcium concentration, and neurons because it opens up the ryanodine receptors on the endoplasmic reticulum within your neurons. So what I'm saying is it doesn't just do what cortisol does to increase uh, cytoplasm calcium. It also uh, lets it come out of the endoplasmic reticulum through the ryanodine uh, calcium channels. And that significance is the more calcium you let go into that cytoplasm of a neuron, it means the more you activate it, you hyperactivate it. So it has a stimulant effect that's going to make you anxious, it's going to give you insomnia, um, but it also has the effect that if that neuron is vulnerable for other reasons, and it very often is, mitochondrial inhibitors or poor blood supply, poor oxygen delivery, poor glucose delivery, that neuron's at risk to die, go and do um, apoptosis, program cell death. Okay, So this is an important point. It's overloading the cytoplasm with calcium. You don't want that. That means it's an excitotoxin. Chemicals that increase cytoplasm calcium in the brain are called excitotoxins. Caffeine is an excitotoxin, okay? And it's actually worse than that. It's an immunoexcitotoxin. Okay, so we know it increases anxiety. I'm just showing you the paper for the sake of showing you a paper, but... All right, <clears throat> it also increases the risk of seizure. So if you have a predisposition to having a seizure, caffeine will increase the risk. 
Okay, now <clears throat> here's just a couple papers before I get to. The, I got a big, a big reveal that I'm going to show you in just a little bit, but just a, a warm up to it. Caffeine treatment aggravates secondary degeneration after spinal cord injury. What that means is, person has an initial spinal cord injury, uh, and this makes it less likely they're going to be able to heal, which would be expected if you're going to decrease blood supply to a tissue. It's not going to heal as well. If you're going to increase activation of the neurons, that means they're going to require increased energy demand, meaning increased mitochondrial function, increase uh, oxygen and glucose delivery from the blood, how the heck are they going to heal if you're overactivating them? It's going to be harder to heal. So spontaneous functional recovery was blocked after the animals were subjected to caffeine daily. Caffeine administration increased demyelination and it produced astrocyte and microglia activation. So that's an important phrase to remember. It increased the amount of microglia being activated. That's why it's also an immunotoxin to the brain. The neurotoxicity effect of caffeine may be associated with the inhibition of neural repair, neuron repair, and the promotion of neuroinflammation. So it made everything worse, okay? So that's bad. So what does that mean? If somebody's got traumatic brain injury, traumatic spinal cord injury, they should not be drinking caffeine. That's what that means. Okay, um, influence of caffeine on collagen biosynthesis in human skin fibroblasts. So this is in humans. Caffeine inhibited collagen biosynthesis in a dose-dependent manner, meaning the more you drank, the worse it was. And why do I tell you this? Because there's a synergistic effect of all the things in the common Western diet that are damaging collagen. Collagen is about one-third of the proteins in your body. It's the most common human protein. Your ligaments are largely made out of collagen, as is your connective tissue. So you're screwing up your collagen. Okay, what else does that? We talked about this before. Ischemia, lack of blood flow, is not good for the ligaments. Okay, what else is bad for the ligaments? Well, fluoride is bad for the ligaments, F minus, because it disrupts the hydrogen bonding. And um, I've talked about that in previous lectures, my lectures on the spine. We know glyphosate is bad for the ligaments, the collagen, because it's a triple helix, and every third residue in the collagen fibrils is a glycine, and glyphosate, glycine phosphate, um, <clears throat> can substitute for the glycine, according to the research work of uh, Stephanie Seneff. She wrote the book Toxic Legacy. Thus, it disrupts the triple helix of the collagen, weakening the ligaments. And I see degenerative spine disease all day long. It's a disaster. The whole spine ends up, you know, fused all together, and the person's all stiff and weak and pathetic. So what I'm saying is caffeine is working to damage those ligaments with glyphosate, with F minus with a lack of vitamin C. You need vitamin C to synthesize uh, collagen correctly. So look at the typical Western <clears throat> Westerner. They're not eating their fruits and vegetables to get their vitamin C. So they're on the low side on the vitamin C. Then they're on the high side on the caffeine. They're on the high side on the F minus. It's in their tap water and then their toothpaste. And they're in the high side on the GP if they're not eating organic only. Okay, and anything sprayed with GP. Okay, so that's how their spines are screwed up. All right, so now we're getting to the money. Here's the reason why I made this talk. <clears throat> Here's a big paper. Well, the first thing you have to watch out for, too, if you go into the, the medical literature, you will see papers that say, oh, no, caffeine's wonderful. It makes you live longer. It makes everything better. And watch out for the word preponderance. I've noticed that when people are trying to bullshit you, they'll say the preponderance of evidence says that caffeine and coffee and tea are good for you. And here's why I would say watch out for that. What happens is industry sees the papers come out. And the papers come out and they say their product causes health problems, you know, caffeine, coffee, tea, whatever. So what the companies do is they just buy a journal and they buy the scientists and they produce then a bunch of papers. So let's say five papers came out showing there were significant problems with caffeine, coffee, and tea. Well, the industry will just buy a couple papers and they'll hire a bunch of scientists to make their product look good. And they'll quickly publish, you know, 10, 20 papers saying, oh, caffeine, coffee, and tea, they're wonderful, they're magic. You know, um, and so that's why you can't go by preponderance. You have to go by, does the paper seem true? And I can tell you, in general, older papers where they're not out for financial interest and they're not industry funded, they tend to be much, 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 much more accurate. Okay, and so you know something that increases cortisol and catecholamines like acute stress and like caffeine, they're going to cause sleep deprivation, which causes more elevation of cortisol and catecholamines and can easily put you into a vicious cycle. You know caffeine is addictive. You know people, when they quit, they have withdrawal symptoms. Okay, and I knew that chronic psychological stress causes microglial activation, meaning it's immunocerebral toxin. So I figured caffeine would be too, and I looked it up, and yeah, it is. Okay, I just showed you one paper showing it causes microglial activation. Microglia are the macrophages of the brain. They're the immune system of the brain. You don't want them activated. When, they act, when they're activated, they release toxic chemicals that cause brain damage. Okay, so 
You really want to minimize microglial activation as best you can. There's a real smart researcher. His name is Jared Younger. He has a YouTube channel. You can check it out. It's called Neuroinflammation. Jared Younger, um, and younger as in a younger person. He's a real clever guy, and he says, yeah, you know, it's good to study neurons, he said, but you're not going to minimize neurodegeneration until you figure out how to stop activating microglia. He says microglia activation is the key event in neurodegeneration and inflammation. So I would actually say, you know, you, you can't forget excitotoxicity, but Jared Younger, he's a smart guy, and he's dedicated his life to researching brain inflammation, okay? And, and what he's saying is you don't want to activate microglia. Well, here we are. Chronic psychological stress activates microglia. Caffeine, as expected, activates microglia. So you should try to control your stress, <clears throat> and you should avoid caffeine, okay? It's pretty simple. So anyways, I figured it would increase microglial activation, and it does. It also drops blood flow to the brain. That's known to cause <laughs> dementia, neurodegeneration. That's the Jack Delatory theory right there. That also is a subset of my theory, the Peter Rogers MD, uh, supply and demand theory of neurodegeneration. It's pretty obvious, okay? Caffeine increases blood glucose level. It causes insulin resistance, so it increases your risk of diabetes. Great. It increases your risk of atrial fibrillation. Great. It increases your risk of seizure. Great. It causes sleep deprivation. Wonderful. Okay, it's for chumps. Come on. Okay, so in this paper here, chronic caffeine ingestion caused microglial activation. It also decreased microglial density. I wonder if it's killing some of the microglia. Bad, bad, bad. You don't want to kill them either. You just want them sitting around in their resting phase so they can do what they're supposed to do you know, participate in neurogenesis and synaptogenesis, beneficial functions of the brain related to memory and learning. And you don't want them activated, though, where they go on to, you know, uh, destruction mode where they think the brain's infected and they start releasing toxic chemicals to sterilize the infection and they damage, they damage brain tissue by collateral damage. Okay, so this is, this is an important paper here. Chronic caffeine ingestion caused microglial activation. Caffeine caused increased size of the cell body uh, but de decreased pseudopodia, decreased ramification. So what that's all about is a microglia has a resting phase where it's shaped like a starfish with these big pseudopodia extending outward. They call them branches or ramifications. It just means branches. But when the person, uh, when the when the animal ingested the uh, caffeine, they they shortened their their pseudopodia and they pulled them back in. They became more circular with a bigger cell body, and that's the characteristic appearance of microglial activation. And it didn't happen in the control group. It just happened in the uh, caffeine groups. And the more caffeine, the worse. I'm going to show you a picture of that in just a moment. It's not the greatest picture in the world, but here it is. Caffeine impacted microglial density and morphology. So here's the controls, normal control, and here's the normal uh, microglia. They got a lot of branches, pseudopodia coming out away from their cell body. <clears throat> the more caffeine they had, you see you lose a lot of these branches. So they're going from a ramified branched uh, morphology shape to an activated microglia shape. That's not good. LPS also does it, lipopolysaccharide, brain toxins, traumatic brain injury does that. Those are some of the other things that will activate microglia. Ischemia, infection, a lot of things that start with the letter I, ischemia, infection. Um, here's another paper, caffeine energy drinks uh, cause structural damage to the hippocampus. Hippocampus is the memory center of the brain, it's pretty important. Caffeine damaged hippocampus causing increased vacuolation with increased duration. Okay, so they had three groups of rats, a control group getting no caffeine, then two other groups, sort of, uh, you know, the medium dose, the higher dose. The more caffeine they got, the more vacuolation, neurodegenerative changes, uh, and they were duration dependent. The more prolonged was their drinking of the caffeine, the worse it got. So I think that might be my last slide. Okay, so anyways, I think that's pretty interesting. Caffeine contributes to brain damage. Yeah, of course, it's a gradual effect, but, you know, people drink caffeine often starting from when they're teenagers up until they die, you know, at 70 years old. So why not skip the caffeine and be a little smarter and healthier in your uh, older years rather than fat, sick, and stupid like uh, most Westerners?